Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's Hot Topic program. What is a species? Clues from the hominin fossil record, featuring biological anthropologist Ryan McRae and part of our ongoing Hot Human Origins Today topic series. My name is Brianna Pobiner, and I'm a paleoanthropologist and educator at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. I'm a brown and gray haired woman wearing a bright blue scarf and a black and white shirt in front of a zoom screen with an African savanna photo with grass and an acacia tree behind me. Whether this is your first time joining us or you've attended Hot Topics before, we're so glad to have you here. I want to note that we had to reschedule the program with our original speaker for today, Dr. Grace Veach. Her Hot Topic event will now be on October 12th. You can register for the rescheduled date on the National Museum of Natural History website. If you're a hardcore Hot Topics fan, you may remember that we unfortunately also had a reschedule last month. You can find information about that event also on our website now. That will be on September 21st, or the, the information about that will be coming very soon. We thank you for your continued support, and we hope to see you there. Before we get started, I have a few housekeeping notes. This discussion offer closed offers closed captioning. You can turn the captions on or off via the CC button, which should be located at the bottom of the Zoom interface. It looks like a little speech bubble. I'm sorry, it looks like a little square that says CC. Um, and we are in a webinar format, so we can't see or hear you. Um, as you have questions, please go ahead and submit them to the Q&A box, which is at the top or bottom of your screen. That one has the two speech bubbles. Um, that way we can sort through as many questions as possible because the Q&A time really flies by. <clears throat> the Q&A box is also where we'll share any relevant links during the program, so keep an eye out there. We'll start with an opening presentation by our speaker, Ryan McRae, and then I'll join him here to take your questions. During the presentation, I may also write answers to some of your questions, at least any that I can answer. Now I'd like to go ahead and introduce our speaker. Ryan McRae is a biological anthropologist interested in the evolutionary relationships between extinct species of great apes and human ancestors. Specifically, he studies how species can be recognized in the fossil record and how living species can be used as models of hominin, our ancestors, evolutionary relationships and trends. Additionally, he's passionate about scientific outreach and public understanding of science. Ryan holds a BA from Yale University and will finish his PhD at George Washington University in the next few months. And now I'm excited to hand over to Ryan. Thank you, Brianna, for that introduction. Hopefully I'll be finishing in the next few months. Um, and thank you for everyone uh, for being here as well. I know the rescheduling is a schedule a problem, but I appreciate you showing up. Um, so we're going to be talking about what is a species in the context of the hominin fossil record. Um, we're going to start off talking about species a bit more generally, how we think about species conceptually and practically, and then looking at some hominin examples and some, some examples from my own dissertation research. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. So this should be somewhat familiar from high school biology class or any other biology class. This is the Linnaean classification system, and it's the way that scientists classify any biological organism in a sort of hierarchical structure from more general, the kingdom side, to the more specific, the species side. And for most species that are alive today, it's fairly obvious when they are different from each other. If you ask any kindergartner what they see here in these pictures, they'll say, oh yeah, that's a lion on the left and a tiger on the right. Um, but for a lot of organisms, including these, when we start to strip back some of those identifying layers, like the lion's mane, the tiger's stripes, even if we get down just to the bones, the differences between those species are a bit less obvious. And we have to rely on other uh, lines of evidence to sort of differentiate between them and see where the lines between those species are drawn. Um, and this is a lion and a tiger skull, not two skulls of the same species. It gets a little murkier when we get into some of the functional biology of organisms as well. Lions and tigers both hybridize with each other, producing either a liger or a tigon offspring, depending on which side of the breeding pair is male or female. Um, this gets at one of many species concepts or different ways of thinking about species, the biological species concept. Biological species concept states that if organisms are able to interbreed and produce fertile offspring, then they have to be members of the same species. Uh, ligers and tigons are not fertile, so they can't go on and produce offspring themselves. 
So lions and tigers are okay as far as the biological species concept is concerned, but that's not always the case for other organisms. There are many species concepts to consider, um, and not any one species concept is really applicable universally across all living things. Um, as an example from my undergrad research, we look at variation in organisms as well. So these are all skulls of gorillas from the Yale Peabody Museum uh, at Yale University in Connecticut. And if you look at them just at first, you'll start to see that they all look somewhat similar to each other, but the longer you look, the more you'll be able to pick out some uh, smaller differences between them. Maybe differences in overall size, differences in how the eyes or the nose are shaped, differences in how the teeth look. Um, and we're interested in what those differences are, but also what those differences mean. So what do the individuals in this photo represent? How many are male or female? How many could be adult or juvenile, non-adult? Uh, how many are Eastern versus Western gorillas, Eastern lowland gorillas, Western, uh, or Eastern mountain gorillas, Western lowland gorillas, which are actually two different species? Are any of these not gorillas? And how do we know where these different factors in variation actually come from and how do we measure them? Well, for living species, it's a bit easier because we have multiple lines of evidence to draw from. We have the bones of the species, of course, and if it's a particularly long-lived species, you might even have fossils. We can observe behavior, like uh, Jane Goodall observing behavior of chimpanzees in the wild. We have DNA and other molecular evidence to draw from, DNA um, proteins and enzymes as well. We can look at diet and the environment that they live in, and we can also look at the growth and development of organisms, how they change over the course of their lifetime. For fossil species, we aren't blessed with as many different lines of evidence. We have bones and fossils, but they're usually few and incomplete. Even a complete skeleton in a fossil context isn't necessarily going to have every bone of that individual. And we sometimes have DNA and molecules, but only for the most recent extinct species, um, like Neanderthals and Denisovans in a hominin context. So if you do the same sort of thought experiment with a set of hominin skulls, these are skulls of different hominin fossils rather than gorillas now. We can try to group them based on uh, shared characteristics. If we do that, we can line them up something like this. Beyond shared characteristics, we can use a timeline, look at when they lived, presuming that if two fossils lived around the same time, they're more likely to be members of the same species. We can also look at where they lived, um, in this case, in Africa and Asia. If two fossils are from the same time in the same area, they're more likely to be from the same species. So if we group these fossils together based on all those features, here we're grouping them based on their shared or and differed morphology, morphology referring to the form and structure of the organisms. So the, the fossils that are in a bubble are sort of distinct from the other fossils that are in different bubbles. If we think back to what these bubbles might represent, we can go to our Linnaean classification system again. For every species, a species is given a Latin binomial name referring to the genus or the general classification of that organism and the species or specific classification of that organism. And that's actually where genus and species come from, the Latin names for general and specific. In our hominin example, these bubbles refer to the genera, plural for genus, of these hominin fossils, Sahelanthropus, Ardipithecus, Australopithecus, and Homo. This process of classifying the organisms is referred to as taxonomy, in this case, alpha taxonomy. If we want to go one step further and try to identify what species these fossils belong to, we can do that. I've gone ahead and put the species name on here because these are already known and studied fossils. But when it comes to the process of identifying species, Usually we do that with reference to one or more type specimens. A type specimen is often the first fossil of a species that is found, or one of the first, that in theory you would uh, compare all new finds to to determine if it's more similar to existing species or different enough from them to be named as a new species. So in this case, we end up with our six species of fossil hominins split into four genera. It's not always that clean and neat, however. When you think about the question of what is a species, it's actually sort of two separate questions. What is a species in a more conceptual or ideological sense, and how do we delimitate or differentiate between and identify species? In the more conceptual sense, we can think of species as being a least inclusive category in the taxonomic system, 
meaning that it's sort of the smallest possible grouping that we can get for uh, biological organisms at large. We can consider that a species has to be a real entity, either that it is systematically in terms of our classification system or biologically in terms of how evolutionary, in, in terms of how evolution works, that it's actually essential, that species have to exist for these systems to function the way that we hypothesize and expect them to. Um, we can also take the easy route out and say that species is just the second half of a Latin binomial. It's a name that we slap on something and leave it there. Um, the way that scientists approach these is somewhat less important because more practically we want to be able to differentiate between and identify new species. So we can do this via employing one or more species concepts, like the biological species concept based in interbreeding compatibility, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, there's a morphological species concept based in shared and differed uh, visible traits. Um, also things like a phylogenetic species concept based on distinct evolutionary lineages. Um, in a more practical basis, we consider all available evidence that we have, morphology, genetics, geographical range, even conservation status can play a large role in uh, identifying new species. And when it comes to differentiating between and identifying new species, you can sort of split that process up um, into two different categories. A process-based evolution, process in this case referring to evolutionary change, for example, um, or pattern-based evolution, uh, similarities and differences that are observable. If we skip back to our hominin example, what we've done already separating them into species based on morphology is more the pattern side of that, doing it based on how they look. If we want a process-based definition as well, we can sort of look at the relationships between them, which I've superimposed here. In this case, every line refers to an evolutionary lineage, and where two lines meet at a node, it refers to a common ancestor of everything happening past that node moving up the tree. When doing this based on shared and differing characteristics, this is referred to as cladistics, where you create a cladogram. Um, a grouping of clades or groups of organisms uh, where they are branching off according to their shared and differed morphology. If we were to scale this to time and introduce more variables and factors to get at the actual evolutionary relationships that may or may not match the cladistic relationships, that's referred to as phylogenetics and produces a phylogeny. Like I mentioned before, it's not always so simple. And with hominin evolution in particular, there's a few confounding factors that can influence how we identify new species. This is a timeline from the Human Origins Program's website of the Smithsonian, depicting several different hominin species um, in different groups uh, based on their morphology, the different colors, as well as the span of time from which we know those fossils existed. And at any one point in time, there could be upwards of five or seven different hominin species wandering around on the landscape in the same place at the same time. One of these is particularly long-lived Homo erectus. And Homo erectus is known very well from a famous fossil of Turkana boy found in West Turkana in Kenya. When it comes to identifying Homo erectus fossils, however, they're known from a very wide span of space across Africa and Asia. From multiple lines of evidence and other fossils from human evolution at large, we suspect that Homo erectus as a species had to have evolved somewhere in Eastern Africa, potentially around where Turkana boy was found in Kenya. However, the first fossils of the species that were found and described were actually found all the way over here in the island of Java in Indonesia at the site called Trinil. So if we do what we're supposed to do as scientists and compare new finds to a type specimen, we're comparing finds from northern China, from Georgia, from Algeria, from South Africa to something found all the way in Indonesia that lived in a very different place at a potentially very different time um, to determine whether or not they could be the same species. So it's not always, comparing to a type specimen is not always the most um, advisable way to go when you're looking at species in the fossil record. And even at one site, if we're looking at variation again, these are five different Homo erectus fossils from one site called Dimenisi in Georgia. And just like the gorilla example, if you look at them, they can appear similar at first, but the harder you look, the more differences you'll start to see between them. 
These represent individuals that could be male and female, individuals that are older or younger, individuals that are more robust or have heavier bones and muscle attachments or more gracile, smaller bones and muscle attachments. And understanding what those differences are and what they mean in the fossil record is trickier than with living organisms because that variation can have to do with geographical space, can have to do with time, if it lives 2 million or 1 million years ago, male or female, different sexes. Um, ontogeny and senescence, ontogeny meaning growth, senescence meaning aging, how bones and fossils change according to growth and aging. There's variation within and between populations of the same species, and even variation between individuals within a population. There's also phenotypic and genotypic variation. All of the things that we're observing and looking at in bones and fossils only tell us about the phenotypic variation or how you look. Modern humans, for example, are very, very phenotypically diverse. We are very diverse in the way that we look, but we are not genotypically diverse whatsoever. Chimpanzees, on the other hand, are less phenotypically diverse, but have a much, much larger genotypic or genetic diversity than modern humans do. So where hominins in general or different hominin species fall along that spectrum is still a bit unclear. We can get at this with morphology using several uh, methods, like metric, me no, metric methods, actually measuring the bones to try to get quantification. We can look at individual features for presence, absence of features in different species, to try to understand variation. Um, so we really just use whatever methods we can because we don't have growth, development, uh, behavior, diet, all those things that we have for living organisms. So that takes me to my dissertation itself. And my dissertation, or at least the first chapter of my dissertation, kind of takes the stance of, in order to understand these differences between and within species, you have to, at a base level, understand what each species is made up of, what the fossil record of each species or the fossil record at large looks like. Um, in other words, how many fossils and what parts of the skeleton are actually represented. So for 14 African hominin taxa, I'm looking at how many fossils there are and what parts of the skeleton are represented within those fossils for each species, as well as how the hypodyme, hypodyme meaning the overall fossil record um, for each species, is similar or different from each other and what factors might contribute to those differences. So across the skeleton, I split individual bones into discrete parts. Um, the femur, for example, your thigh bone right here, you can see my cursor, is split into four individual parts that I look at to see how many femoral heads, proximal, shaft, and distal fem femora there are for each species. Individual teeth are counted as their own, and different parts of the cranium, mandible, and other parts of the skeleton are split up accordingly as well. The results of that you can see here. And there's a lot going on here. So in the top left, you have the sort of expected hominin hypodyme. If, a, if fossils were preserved perfectly across the entire skeleton every time, this is what the proportional presence of different parts of the skeleton would look like um, for hominins. And you have the nine uh, skeletal regions in the key in the middle, everything from the head all the way down to ankle and foot. As you can probably tell, for the hominin total in the top right, and for most of the hominin species at the bottom, permanent dentition and teeth in general vastly outweigh all other parts of the skeleton in the fossil record, which is not unexpected because teeth are already mineralized in living organisms, so they fossilize very well, they preserve very well compared to other bones. Um, in this case, N also refers to the individual parts of bones that are counted, not the total number of fossils. So the total number of fossils described for each species will actually be lower than the number presented here. There's a few things we can pick out right away though. Some species like Australopithecus afarensis and Artipithecus ramidus are known mostly from Ethiopia um, compared to other species that are known mostly from Kenya, Tanzania or mostly from Southern Africa. And these two that are known from Ethiopia seem to have a bit better representation of different parts of the skeleton compared to other fossil species something like Paranthropus or Homo habilis in the bottom, which are known from mostly outside of Ethiopia. So there could be geography at play. Um, if we look again at this, we can see another species, Australopithecus sediba, seems like it has the most even representation of different parts of the skeleton between all the species. Um, and that seems like a great thing at first, but it's important also to know that the hypodyme of the species, Australopithecus sediba, 
consists of almost exclusively two complete skeletons, MH1 and MH2, from the cave site of Malapa in southern Africa. So even though we have a lot of very good fossils from across the skeleton for Sediba, if we're looking into comparative studies, we really only have two individuals from which to describe an entire species. If you were to do that with modern humans, pick any two modern humans on the planet to describe the entire species, you'd be very, very hard pressed to encompass the entire variation of modern humans in just two individuals. So my research kind of brings that to light and uh, gives us things to keep in mind when we're looking at the hominin fossil record. So a few questions as to how we form um, and interpret hypotheses with hominin paleontology come to light. How many, fossils does, how many fossils does it actually take to name a species? Sometimes new species are named just from one fossil. Sometimes scientists wait until more fossils are found, but it depends. How can we compare species that aren't represented by the same bones at all? If you look at a Rorantugonensis in the top left, it's mostly uh, described by pelvic girdle and hind limb bones, parts of your leg, versus something like Canianthropus platyops in the top right, which has zero leg bones whatsoever. So comparing between those species and trying to identify differences between them is not really possible if they don't have the same parts of the skeleton. How much can we really know about species that are only teeth? Teeth can tell us a lot, but when you consider the skeleton at large, they're only one small part of our entire skeleton. So they're only giving us a piece of the picture. And beyond that, what if teeth actually vary more with diet and environment than they do with real evolutionary relationships? The two very unrelated organisms could eat similar things, live in similar ways, and have similar teeth, even if they're not closely related. Some things to keep in mind. Um, last but not least, I look at another measure that I call percent proportional hypodyme change, which is basically how far from the hominin expected values do the skeletal regions in each species actually vary? Um, in this case, we have the hominin expected sort of at the zero level on the y-axis and the different hominin species as well as the total um, on the x-axis. And each of the colored bars refer to a different skeletal region in the key on the top right. One thing we can pick out right away again is that the light yellow color, the permanent addition, is vastly overrepresented in the fossil record compared to what we would expect um, under a typical in a ideal preservation scenario. Additionally, almost all parts of the postcranial skeleton, everything from your axial skeleton, your vertebrae and ribs, down through your ankle and foot, is vastly underrepresented compared to the hominin, um, hominin expected. If you think about the skeleton at large, there's a lot of information in the head, but there's also a lot more information in the postcrania that's being lost in the fossil record that we have to consider. If we look at Sediba again, we can see that all of its values are very, very close to zero, meaning that it's closer to the hominin expected. But remember that it's represented mostly by two complete skeletons, so it doesn't tell us too much in a comparative context. Something like Australopithecus afarensis, if we look three species to the left, is also fairly close to the zero line. It was represented by more fossils and more individuals, so it can tell, it can tell us a lot more about the species in a comparative context. So in conclusion, to get back to the original question of what is a species, and spoiler alert, I'm not going to answer this with a single sentence. <laughs> what is a species? We can consider it from several different species concepts, the biological species concepts with breeding compa compatibility, morphological species concepts, how things look, ecological species concepts, how things, how things live and where they live, and phylogenetic species concepts um, based on the evolutionary trajectory of organisms. More practically, we're also constrained by available data and fossils, or constrained by the pressure to publish, not only the pressure to publish, period, but the pressure to publish new species, because new species are a very hot and exciting thing. Um, we're constrained by related organisms that we can compare new finds to, especially if we're dealing with fossil species that don't have any living relatives or living descendants. And we're constrained again by that variation factor. Um, morphological variation, variation over time, space, and all those other factors that we talked about. Um, so what is a species is not a super simple question, and the best answer I can give is that a species is basically whatever the scientific community agrees collectively is a species, based on all of these factors in consideration.
So thank you in advance for your questions, and I'm happy to answer any questions on the species, any questions on hominins, um, or in general. I'm usually behind the scenes answering your questions from the Q&A box like Brianna is going to be doing now. Um, so it's a bit interesting to be on the other side of it. Fantastic. Thank you, Ryan. And um, as questions are coming in, I'm actually going to um, start with a couple of my own. Um, I, I'm going to take the privilege to ask the first question, and maybe it's a big question. Um, do you think the way that scientists, paleoanthropologists have named species, has that changed over time as far as kind of the history of our discipline? And if so, how has it changed, do you think? It's definitely changed over time, yeah. Um, so it used to be back in the day that every new fossil would be a new species. This was a problem not only with human paleontology, but with dinosaurs and other groups as well. And as time progresses, as you find more fossils and think about different lines of evidence, you have to be flexible with those species names and rethink what you've already gone over in the past. And that's sort of the whole point of science. We make and test hypotheses, not assuming that they're going to be universally true, but they could be susceptible to change later on down the line. So Homo erectus, for example, used to be I think it's like seven or eight different species names, um, have even different genus names like Telanthropus used to exist and no longer exist because they've been subsumed under that one species as time goes on. Um, all right, I'm going to jump off of this one also and ask a Homo erectus, Homo ergaster question. Um, so, you know, Homo erectus, as you mentioned, it's the longest lived species on our family tree. It's, pro it's the probably besides Homo sapiens, the most geographically widespread. Um, what's your feeling on that all being one species versus being two? Because I know that, you know, I, I feel like in our discipline, there is, you know, there are people that call all the African fossils Homo ergaster and all the Asian ones Homo erectus. What's your, and I know that's a, in some sense, a philosophical question about how much variation is within a species. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so Homo erectus, some people say Homo erectus is everything across the globe. Some people split the Asian fossils into Homo erectus, African into Homo ergaster, like you mentioned. Um, some people say that basically all hominins, even outside of Homo erectus, are all Homo erectus, even things like Homo heidelbergensis, uh, the fossils from Atapuerca in Spain, that they're all, it's all Homo erectus and always has been. So opinions on this vary. <laughs> and no matter what stance you take, you're going to get in, in trouble with somebody. <laughs> um, but the way that I like to think about it is to consider what Homo erectus is most closely related to in terms of living organisms, which is Homo sapiens, us. If we think about modern human diversity, we're, like I said, extremely diverse in our phenotype or our appearance, not only in our outward appearance and our bone structure and our size or height, our size laterally as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so why should we expect that hominins would be any different, especially something that looks as close to us as Homo erectus does? So I think that allowing for a wide range of variation within hominin species is not a bad idea. The question is just where you would draw that line. And I think that where you draw the line is a bit trickier and I think that we have to rely on not only morphology, but also thinking about how long we see species at a certain site, um, variation in geography and time more so than just the fossils themselves to help inform where we draw those lines, if those lines exist at all in the first place. <laughs> well, and I think that is also sort of a philosophical question. I mean, speciation is a process that happens over time. So like deciding where to draw the lines, I think can be difficult. This is why I don't study hominin taxonomy. I think it's um, fascinating and important and we need to be able to communicate with each other um, about like, you know, species and, and um, the fossils that we're talking about and all of that. So, um, all right, so I have another question, um, which is you, I, I appreciated how you talked about lions and tigers and that they can hybridize but in nature they don't live in the same place so they don't so hybrids in our evolutionary history um can you give some examples of what we know about that from the genetic record and how does that kind of mess with our idea of what a species is <laughs> 
Yeah, so lions and tigers hybridize only in captivity, like you said, because they don't live in the same place in the wild. There are other mammals that hybridize in the wild, like different species of baboons that hybridize very, fairly regularly. And we have evidence for hybridization in human evolution as well, um, both from morphological and from genetic data. Um, we have good evidence that modern humans, uh, if you are descended from modern humans outside of Africa, that you will have some proportion of Neanderthal DNA in you, something like two or one to four percent, I think, at most. And that's good evidence that at some point in our evolutionary history, there was what was called introgression or inbreeding from the Neanderthal lineage into ours, um, meaning that uh, probably fairly early on in our evolutionary trajectory, we got Neanderthal DNA, probably from interacting with them in the Near East, um, Levant, Israel, Palestine, Syria area. Um, more so than later on in Europe, where we also know that modern humans and Neanderthals lived together, not necessarily together, but lived in Europe at the same time, mm -hmm. <laughs> not necessarily at the same sites mm -hmm. together. Um, there's also evidence that if you are descended from human populations in Asia or Southeast Asia, that you'll have a lot of, not a lot, but some Denisovan in DNA, which is another group. Um, and when it comes to identifying species, Denisovans are interesting because they don't have an official species name, really. They're just known as the Denisovans, a distinct group of hominins, but we're not really sure where they belong in terms of species, whether they're more closely related to humans or Neanderthals or in between. Um, so here's a fun question from Carrie, who, who says, starts the question for fun. <laughs> How do you think, I like this, how do you think future humans will change to create a new offshoot? For example, size, is it as, as it is happening? So like, would you see, would you predict that there would be do different species of humans in the future? Um, maybe. <laughs> I, I will say there are different species of humans in the past because everything that is a hominin is technically a human, even though we refer to ourselves as human, human right. applies to every hominin species. So there have been multiple species of hominins. There's no reason to think that there wouldn't be in the future. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a big fan of like sci-fi fantasy stuff as well. And there are some sci-fi shows where humans go and colonize the asteroid belt and other planets. If something like that were to happen over the long term, if there is limited to no interaction between the two groups, it's possible that the two groups over thousands, millions of years could diverge into different species. In reality, what we know about human history is that humans like to move around a lot and we like to interact with each other a lot. And that history of interaction, I don't see going away in the future whatsoever. And with interaction comes physical interaction and gene flow between different populations, um, which might produce different forms of variation within a species. But if you have constant interaction between different groups, it's highly, highly unlikely that that group will speciate into two distinct species over time. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and considering how widespread humans are today and our in ever increasing population, that's definitely probably a, like, you know, in the negative column for speciation of humans, as long as we stay on this planet, I guess. Yeah. Here's a good question from Jim, um, who says, you mentioned the pressure to publish issue. I was in grad school in the 1960s when the publisher parish pressure was immense. How important do you consider that pressure is on you and your work today? Has it been a considerable detraction? Um, for me personally, I don't think it has been a huge issue. Um, it depends what you would like to do as well academically. So me personally, I'm more interested in education and outreach opportunities than I am in tenure track academia. If you are someone who really wants to follow tenure track academia and be a, a tenured professor, get research grants, et cetera, you have to publish because that's how you bring in money and keep your job. Um, not to say that other aspects of academia aren't also pressured to publish, <laughs> um, but beyond myself, it is sometimes apparent in publications that you read. If you read a publication, you think this is sort of overreaching in their conclusions, or they're trying to draw conclusions that aren't really supported by the evidence they're giving. 
a lot of times there's not just pressure to publish, but pressure to publish on specific things. If you get grant money for studying human evolution, even if you're looking at rats, you have to relate it to human evolution somehow. So even if that's not like a direct connection, there's still pressure to do that. And sometimes, sometimes it's less obvious and sometimes it's more obvious in different scientific papers when that might be occurring. Yep. Thank not going to name any papers or any names, though. <laughs> <laughs> That's wise, I think. Um, here's a good basic question from B, who says, I'm not sure if I missed it. How exactly do organisms turn into a different species? So maybe you could talk about the speciation process. Yeah, no, that's a great question, B. And I intentionally did not talk about that because <laughs> it's, a, it's a whole other can of worms. Um, so speciation is, like we've said before, and like Brianna said earlier, it's a process. It's not just one day a light flip switches and you're suddenly two different species. It's something that occurs over a span of time. Sometimes that span of time can be very short um, in something that has low generation times like bacteria that reproduce constantly. For organisms that we think of as being more interesting, like humans and large mammals, um, it takes a lot more time. Uh, so to observe speciation in real time in organisms like ourselves, we can't really do that in the span of a human lifetime, probably not even in the span of the thousands of years that humans have been observing things. Um, there's a few different ways speciation can occur. The most sort of intuitive is having a hard barrier between two different populations within a species. A barrier could mean that you're on two different islands. It could mean that a mountain range comes up in between your two species and you can't interact with each other anymore. Or it could be something more subtle, like a genetic mutation that does not allow you to interbreed with the other population anymore. Um, it can also be even more subtle in that the gene flow happening between populations just sort of shifts over time and happening less and less. And over time, you're gradually different until all of a sudden we consider that two different species. Um, how often those different scenarios actually happen, we don't really know as scientists. Um, we just observe the sort of results of those processes and try to infer the process from the results that we see, if that makes sense. Yeah, exactly. So it sounds like, you know, there's a genetic component, um, there's a time component, there's mm -hmm. a component of variation. So yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, here's an interesting question. This person said, to piggyback on Carrie's question, how do you see the waning presence of four wisdom teeth in modern Homo sapiens as a possible example of a new species of Homo. How, what do you think about that? Yeah, um, I, that is an example of evolution occurring in real time, actually. Um, but it's not necessarily speciation. We can think about evolution occurring in terms of microevolution and macroevolution, sort of two different forms. Microevolution are sort of more discrete changes that we can observe through time. Things like wisdom teeth. Some people have them, some people don't. Macroevolution are those broad scale changes, the speciation level changes, and they're sort of happening at completely different time scales to each other. So humans across the globe, not just necessarily industrial populations, have a history of uh, wisdom teeth problems, having shorter jaws, having no wisdom teeth. I myself actually only had wisdom teeth on the top. I didn't have any on the bottom ever. So less surgery for me, I guess. <laughs> Um, but it's an example of, of how evolution is occurring. As modern humans eat more of a processed diet, we rely less on our masticatory or chewing apparatus, our jaws and our muscles, and we see the sort of shrinking and shortening of the human jaw over time in the modern age as well as throughout human evolution. That sort of shortening of the prognathic jaw is a feature from more earlier hominins to more later hominins, making a generalization. Um, so at a certain point, it can't shorten anymore because it'll run out of space to shorten it, but uh, it's sort of a continuing trend that we've seen throughout human evolution. Yeah, thank you. So it sounds like probably not a speciation thing, more of a, you know, within species evolution. And this next question follows nice on the sort of species delineation in a sense. So Douglas asks, do you see any value in using subspecies names in the hominin lineage? 
That's a great question. <laughs> if you asked me four or five years ago, I would be very, very pro subspecies. And now yeah. I am not whatsoever. Um, I think subspecies have a very important place when considering living organisms because there is more data or there are more data and there are more observations that we can use to sort of differentiate species at a finer resolution. In the fossil record, when we're not entirely confident that the species we have are delineated properly, let alone the genera might not even be delineated properly, um, Australopithecus is a good example. Australopithecus should probably be split into multiple genera, but depending on how you define what a genus is in the first place. Um, so for the fossil record, I think naming things as subspecies will only get you into more hot water because you're trying to superimpose restrictions on something that there isn't a whole lot of data to back up. Um, that's not to say that it's universally a bad idea. In some hominins, like Paranthropus robustus from South Africa, there is pretty good evidence that the older fossils are slightly more different than the newer fossils, not in the terms of being a different species, but that overall they have sort of different features um, uh, larger features in the, I forget whether it's older or newer that has larger sagittal crests and chewing features. Um, but there are sort of discrete changes that we can pick up in on the fossil record. But to say that those are subspecies evolution occurring, I think I'm not sure we'll ever really be able to say with the evidence that we have from the fossil record. So here's a, this is a question for me following up on subspecies. I know that a lot of people, um, particularly in previous sort of generations of learning, have heard Homo sapiens sapiens as the human species. So um, can you tell us about sort of the history of that and why we have that sort of subspecies designation that, that people have learned? Yeah, definitely. So just like the Paranthropus example that I mentioned, humans have been around, our species, Homo sapiens, have been around for quite a long time. Um, back in the day, we thought it was maybe 100,000 years, then it was pushed back to 200,000 years. Now with fossils from Morocco and Northern Africa, it's pushed back to almost 300,000 years. So over 300,000 years, you can expect things to change at least a little bit. And what we're seeing is that modern humans are in general, across all populations of modern humans, more gracile, have more slender bones, smaller muscles, than do these much older members of our own species. Um, Homo sapiens from 200,000 years ago in Ethiopia or 300,000 years ago in Morocco. Yet those older fossils also have multiple distinct features that we think of as being unique to our species, like having a chin, for example, is actually one of the best defining features for having a Homo sapiens fossil in the fossil record. Um, why chins exist is an entirely different problem. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but so uh, some people attribute modern humans to Homo sapiens sapiens, which is a subspecies of Homo sapiens when you consider both modern and fossil members of our species. Okay. And I, I think I also recall that there, there um, had been when, uh, there had been discussions about Neanderthals being a subspecies of modern humans. So I had also seen sometimes Homo sapiens Neanderthalensis. Yeah. Um, and then, so I didn't know if that maybe had to do with the history of Homo sapiens sapiens as a subspecies. So with humans and Neanderthals, it gets into how you define species. If you rely exclusively on the biological species concept, Humans and Neanderthals produced fertile offspring, and we have evidence for that in almost every human alive outside of Africa, and some even within Africa living today. Um, and if you adhere to the biological species concept, that means that they have to be members of the same species. However, if you look at all other evidence, Homo sapiens sort of have a discrete morphological suite of characters that is consistent within them. Neanderthals have their own discrete suite of characters. They're also sort of the species arose in different places at different times and have, with limited interaction, fairly uh, differentiated evolutionary trajectories from each other. So if you consider multiple species concepts and information as a whole, I, I personally think, and I think that paleoanthropologists, most paleoanthropologists agree, I'll say a good number, maybe not most, but... <laughs> Around 51%, we'll say, <laughs> um, agree that in the total sum of evidence, there's 
more reason for separating Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis into different species than them being the same species. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, I have a question on one of, um, I guess, your slide that showed the different representations of species by different skeletal parts or bones. When you were, you know, creating that and analyzing your data, was anything surprising to you from those findings? Uh, one surprising thing is that after I came up with all of the sort of sub categories like splitting bones into different categories it added up to a hundred nice and evenly um I didn't intend that but after I did that I said okay we're not touching it that's a nice number. <laughs> we're done right um that led to a couple uh problems like for example the cranium is only split into three parts the sort of brain case the face and the base of the cranium mm -hmm. um, in reality there could be a bit more resolution as to what parts of the cranium you're seeing there um in terms of results that surprised me, I didn't expect there to be as noticeable a difference between Ethiopian, predominantly Ethiopian fossils and uh, Eastern Af like Kenyan Tanzanian and South African fossils. Another interesting question is that two different species and two different genera, Homo habilis, um, in this case, we're, we call it early Homo in general. Some people split early Homo into multiple different species. But early Homo in general and Paranthropus boisei both lived in um, Ethiopia, I guess Ethiopia, but mostly Kenya, Tanzania, in the same place around the same time. Um, there are theoretical issues with in terms of site formation and who made what stone tools. Um, there are also questions because it was previously sort of... Uh, I'll say common knowledge in a sense that we didn't have a lot of paranthropus postcranial fossils. We only knew them from the head, but we did have that for Homo habilis. Um, and what this shows is that's actually not the case, that they actually have somewhat similar. Paranthropus does have a bit more teeth compared to early Homo, but they're pretty similar in the fact that there's not great postcranial representation for either of them. One theory behind that was that some fossils attributed to Homo habilis could actually be Paranthropus arms and legs, but this research kind of indicates that that is less likely to be the case because we're just missing the same fossils for both species. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, and I think there's probably also challenges unless you have associated cranial fossils with postcrania how mm -hmm. to know what name to call sort of isolated postcranial fossils and things like that. Exactly. When you get to the whole type specimen issue, it's another problem because for some species, the type specimen is a section of jaw that big, and that's all you have to reference new finds off of. Um, so it, it gets tricky, but that's, that's another thing I was looking at. If there's complete non-overlap between elements, how can you compare things in the first place? So chapter one of my dissertation is really trying to quantify that, how prevalent a problem that might be and what it might mean for our hypotheses in human evolution. I look forward to reading that. <laughs> um, I'm going to jump in with one more of my own question to follow up before we get to more audience questions. And um, the question I have, you mentioned that there seems to be different representations from different countries. Do you think that's a collecting strategy difference like what you know do you have any hypotheses about why that difference has occurred yeah so I suspect that it is less due to depositional context in terms of the environments that these hominins died in or fossilized in and I think it's more due to who was excavating the site and site excavation culture and practices a lot of these Kenyan and Tanzanian fossils, most of the evidence was found in 40s, 50s, 60s, a bit, a bit more of a long time ago. Not to say that the practices were better or worse, but just that they were different. Um, there might have been more of an emphasis on collecting cranial fossils to compare than other fossils. And it's not to say that they didn't collect other fossils, it's just that those other fossils aren't described, aren't attributed to a species. If they aren't mm -hmm. attributed to a species, I don't include them in my mm -hmm. uh, study because the entire point of the study is comparing species. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so those fossils might exist, they're just not studied. So another aspect of my dissertation is to emphasize the need to really study those fossils and learn more about them. Um, in contrast, the Ethiopian sites, um, Afarensis, known mostly from Hadar, 
the first family, there's a lot of um, partial skeletons and complete skeletons from that site. And Ardipithecus rambidus, which is from the late 90s, 2000s, so much more recent in time, the, the sort of um, paradigm of what's important in human evolution has shifted a little bit over time to emphasize um, total evidence more so than just craniodental evidence. So I think that that plays a little bit of a role into why there could be some differences between those regions. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so we will go back to a few audience questions. Um, here's a question from Jay. If examples like Neanderthals and Homo sapiens and grizzly and polar bear hybridization, if those go against the concept of hybridization leading to infertile offspring because they're different species, should we consider changing the concept of species differentiation? Uh, short answer, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Long answer, um, it has to do with getting as much evidence as you can. Um, for example, grizzly bears and polar bears, I'll use that one because that's a bit more poignant in terms of what's going on in the world today. Uh, throughout most of history, they've been pretty well separated into what they do, where they live, polar bears more north, grizzly bears more south. And it's really only in recent times with global warming and shrinking ice, uh, shrinking ice caps that those two pop, those two species have sort of been pushed into each other's range where we can observe this sort of hybridization in the wild. Um, I think they call the hybrids growler bears of those two, <laughs> which is cool. Um, so I think that relying only on hybridization to identify species is, it's a good measure to use, but it shouldn't be the only measure you use. Because even though we see hybridization between those two bears and baboons in Africa and in other species, if we consider a lot of other factors, they're still distinct in their own ways. And it's important to recognize them as different species, mm -hmm. even from a conservation perspective, if nothing else. Because if you call grizzly bears and polar bears the same species, all of a sudden, there's no reason to protect polar bears anymore because they're just white grizzly bears. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, we have time for one or two more questions. So um, I will ask uh, another one from the audience. Um, this is from Donna, and this may be outside of your realm of expertise. Interesting question though. Um, do increasing levels of pollution of all sorts, radiation exposure, et cetera, seem to be increasing variations in human species in more recent times, or, it, or is it too early to tell? Hmm. And I don't know if that question is more about morphological variation, genetic variation. It's it's definitely not my wheelhouse. I do more bones and fossils than genetic stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but what I can say about that is there's sort of this idea in popular culture that like radiation produces mutants, like the, the X-Men series, for example. I, I love it personally, so I find that interesting. <laughs> Um, in reality, what we do know is that increased levels of radiation and pollution do cause genetic mutations, like uh, you're at a greater risk for different types of cancers and other um, acquired diseases because of it. Whether that is going to lead to increased or new variation in the human species, probably not. In order to have those mutations present in the species at large, they have to be passed down from parent to offspring. And if it's something that affects you once you're already an adult, that doesn't really affect your uh, DNA that you're passing on so much, it's not going to be passed on. We might see it as an acquired trait across several generations, but it's not going to be, it's an acquired trait, it's not an inherited trait. Um, so that's why I would say probably not. Mm -hmm. That could change if we get more and more radiation and things get worse and worse, but hopefully that doesn't happen. <laughs> Agreed, exactly. <laughs> All right, so this is a great last question from David. Are you able to say more about why the Denisovans haven't been given a full species name? Um, because there are so few fossils. I recall the main fossil is a hybrid. Has that affected the position? Yeah, so one of the main reasons that the Denisovans are kind of unique in human evolution and that they're known more from their genetic evidence than they are from fossil evidence. Um, the cave of Denisova in Siberia had both Denisovan fossils and Neanderthal fossils, but we only had uh, the pinky bone they took the DNA from and a few teeth of Denisovans. Mm -hmm. 
from the genetic evidence alone, scientists were able to tell that it represented a pretty distinct group from the Neanderthals that were inhabiting the same site. Um, and we were able to pick the, those unique genes up in some modern human populations, specifically in Southeast Asia um, and to Polynesia. Um, as to why it hasn't been named as a new species, I think it having fewer fossils has to do with that, partially because if you find new fossils of Denisovans, you will have no real way of knowing if they're Denisovans unless you test them for DNA, um, which you can do, but testing for DNA currently is also an inherently destructive process. So you have to destroy at least part of the fossil to test for DNA. Um, that being said, there is pretty good evidence that we have a few new Denisovan fossils, a mandible or a lower jawbone from Tibet, um, and I think there was a tooth from Laos that was published recently, Laos in Southeast Asia. So we're starting to get a few more fossils that look like they're probably more Denisovans than Neanderthals, but until we get a sort of better picture of what the species actually is, if it is a species, um, I don't think that it's really going to be named as such. Part of that also has to do with a very prominent research team being involved in investigating this species, um, Svante Pabo. At, uh, he's the go-to person for ancient DNA <laughs> and recently won, won the Nobel Prize for it. Um, so that is also like sort of academic culture playing into it a little bit. If you are in a powerful position, you are able to sort of withhold the species name because people trust you to do so, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so I'm going to wrap up and I want to thank you very much um, and I'll conclude today's virtual program. Please also join me in thanking Ryan for sharing his work with us. I'd also like to give special thanks to those who made this program possible, to our behind the scenes team, um, to our donors, volunteers, and viewers like you. And finally, to all our partners who help us reach, educate, and empower millions of people around the world today and every day. We thank you. Um, please tune in next month on April 13th at 1130 a.m. for our next hot topic with Tom Plummer from CUNY Queens, who will be talking about some recently published research on early stone tools, um, paranthropus teeth, and butchered fossil hippos from a site in Kenya. Very exciting. Um, we've put a link in the Q&A where you can find information about our upcoming programs and how to sign up for the museum's weekly e-newsletter. That's the best way to stay informed on upcoming programs and to learn more about the museum's research and exhibitions. After this webinar ends, you'll see a survey pop up asking for some feedback about the program. Please take a moment to respond. We're very curious to know what topics you might be interested in seeing for future programs, and we appreciate your input. So again, thank you to our participants, um, to Ryan for sharing his work, um, and to the audience. And I also want to give a, um, a little shout out to the Hall of Human Origins. Um, it is our exhibit's birthday tomorrow. Um, the Hall of Human Origins opened 13 years ago on March 17th. So happy birthday to the Hall of Human Origins tomorrow. All right, take care. See you soon. <laughs>